I'm going to pick up just a couple things because there are some lessons here for what we do tomorrow. Uh, I think the most important one that Nancy uh, started with and continued through the panel was your personal stories. When you go to a congressman or a senator's office, whether you meet with a member or you meet with the staff, tell your story. That is going to be the one that touches a staffer. The staffer will probably know uh, some of, but not all of, the data uh, and statistics and all that stuff, but that's going to be in your leave behind. But tell your personal story. And what very frequently will happen is that you'll evoke a personal story back. And you'll create a personal relationship with a member or a staffer uh, and capture that relationship. Keep the name and the phone number and so that you can continue to communicate even when you're back home. This is not a one-day effort. This is a 365-day effort. So tell your story. I think that was a powerful notion. Um, I want to correct one thing, um, uh, Wade. Uh, it was this organization that caused the 2025 goal to be put in place uh, back in 2012. Uh, but what the association did do uh, is that they got an act passed, uh, which in fact required the NIH each year to tell Congress directly, without any uh, comment by the president, uh, what was needed in the following fiscal year to hit the 2025 goal. So what we now have is sort of an engine where the NIH basically says every year, this is what we need next year. And Congress has now two years in a row followed that. So the 400 million increase to 414, but yeah, no, 1.4 going to 1.8 billion. But still, HIV AIDS has about $3 billion plus in investment, cancer six or seven billion. So yes, uh, two billion or 1.8 billion isn't gonna be enough. Uh, but that demonstrates that this movement has many players, the association, us, 90 uh, organizations as part of uh, leaders engaged in Alzheimer's disease, but we're all working for the same engine. So this, is, this has been great. The notion of focus, which I found fascinating, if you set a goal of 2025, one of the first questions you ask is, what is needed to get there? Well, it doesn't turn out that funding is enough. You actually have to get innovative medicines. Well, now you have to talk about how to get ideas out of the lab that are funded by NIH and get them into the market. You have to begin to think about how to make clinical trials faster and better. How do you make them more diverse? How do you really have those clinical trial populations represent America and not just the, 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 the white and Caucasian community? Oops, how about regulatory endpoints? Do they match the science? Oh, what about payers? Does Medicare actually going to pay for a prevention medicine for years before any potential cost uh, savings are made? Then, how do you get physicians to actually detect and diagnose this disease early? Because the disease-modifying drugs will be in the very earliest stage of the disease. So you better get your people diagnosed at the early stages. So it turns out that that focus on the 2025 has a bunch of things in it and a bunch of links. But we are focused in this organization very hard. The problem we've had is how much we go into the care space. That is where I think whether we lose focus or whether that's a central aspect of our focus has really been a somewhat of a, a challenge for us because that's a huge area. So we've basically confined our work here uh, to suggesting a variety of ways to improve quality of care standards and for how to improve the support for family caregivers. So, but I want to just thank you because you've given us a lot of lessons. I got a lot of notes uh, and I appreciate uh, the expertise, the experience that you express. But in the end, I want to thank you most for what you've done. What do you do <laughs> for breast cancer, for AIDS, for the Latino community, for social justice, Wade? I mean, you all have been really champions in your field, and we thank you for being here. And you have been a great spokesperson. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like asking questions instead of asking. So we're going to transition now to our next panel. Uh, uh, this one is going to be led by uh, Jill Lesser. Uh, just a reminder for tomorrow, we are going to be advocating for an increase in the NIH investment in Alzheimer's by $414 million a year. Um, that's what's been recommended by the NIH. Both appropriations subcommittees from both House and Senate have agreed on that number, Senate 414, House 400. Um, 
uh, but we don't have a budget. We started a new fiscal year in the United States government. We don't have a budget, so we need a budget, and we have the budget to include those numbers. And the other, and the other piece of legislation we're advocating for is probably it's called the Capito Alzheimer's Act. It will deal with detection and diagnosis. Uh, it will deal with caregiver support. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, a little disturbance up here in front of the ether. Um, and so you're going to have all those details in front of you. But we're now going to turn uh, to a panel that will be led, as I say, by Jill Lesser. Jill is the Chief Strategy Officer for Us Against Alzheimer's. Uh, Jill Lesser is also the President of Women Against Alzheimer's. Shh, shh, shh. Uh, Women Against Alzheimer's. Uh, and um, I had the great pleasure of working with Jill uh, years ago at AOL and then AOL Time Warner. And she is one of my favorite people. So Jill, Jill, here, here. here. Behind you, as always. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am actually so glad to be um, moderating this panel right after the last panel. Uh, because I think that as we sit here, sometimes you know a lot of the information that we're getting is hard to um, apply uh, as we move forward. And I think that understanding the economic and social impact um, in a very uh, detailed way on this country is going to be so important for our advocacy and for this movement. As George said, as Mike McCurry said, as all of the panelists said before, um, yes, we want to know more than anyone else on the Hill. Yes, we want to uh, speak from the heart. We want to resonate with people's personal stories. And I will say from my own experience up on the Hill with this issue, it is absolutely impossible to be in a member of Congress's or a senator's office and not have someone in your meeting say, I know, me too. And oftentimes it actually is the elected official more often than not. And so in some ways that makes your job easier. Um, but one of the things that we really have to do in this regard is to make people think differently. So there's lots of diseases out there, but what is different? I mean, we all know what is different about this disease. It's broad economic implications. It's implications for family structures, for family dynamics, for putting people into bankruptcy, for putting them on Medicaid in ways they never thought they would ever have to take advantage of um, government uh, uh, entitlements or government benefits. And so this panel is here to talk about um, not only to uh, illuminate some of the issues, but to address, uh, hopefully, some of the ways in which we can move forward. And first and foremost, I want to say we as an organization in trying to cultivate more conversation around um, the economic implications in particular of this disease recently commissioned um, Nick Eberstadt, who's here with us on the panel, uh, to do this report, which is in your bags, Hiding in Plain Sight. Um, and Nick will talk more about this, but it really does overlay some incredible demographic trends in this country um, on top of the Alzheimer's crisis. And for me, many of the results were pretty startling. So I am anxious to hear from everyone on this panel. Um, I would like to start actually with Dr. Eberstadt, who holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at AEI, at the American Enterprise Institute where he researches and writes on demographics and economics generally with a particular focus, interestingly, in the Korean Peninsula and Asia. But domestically, he focuses on poverty and social well-being. So Dr. Eberstadt. Jill, thank you very much. Uh, let me salute you all for your dedication and good work. And let me uh, just mention, less ago unsaid, uh, I am uh, an independent consultant for this uh, project, not in my capacity as a researcher for AEI. Um, in this paper here, which I think you may all have, um, I don't come up with any real great uh, rocket science or research breakthroughs. I just kind of tell you things that you know already, but that really haven't been connected. I don't think the dots have all been connected on this. We know that our society is constantly a moving target. 
or, uh, social trends are changing, economic trends are changing, technological capabilities are changing. Uh, one of the reasons that the Alzheimer's epidemic stands to be so much more devastating in the future than it is today is because one of the trends we know very well. The uh, entirely predictable graying of American society. That's one moving target that we're locked onto pretty well. But there are other moving targets in our society that I think are making us more vulnerable in the future than we appreciate today. And I mentioned three of these in this paper. Uh, one has to do with changing family structure. Another has to do with the rise of the live alone seniors. And the third has to do with what we might call financial preparedness or the lack thereof for critical groups in our society. Um, a little while earlier this year, uh, Professor Robert Putnam of Harvard testified before the Joint Economic Committee that he thought uh, the um, institutional care component of uh, caregiving for people living with dementia was going to roughly double as a, proportion, as a proportion of total sufferers. And one of the reasons he made this argument is that he was looking at some of the demographic trends. He was looking at the decline in the proportion of older people with spouses, the decline in the proportion of older people with living, surviving children. But it's actually even, I think, starker than Professor Putnam suggested. Uh, we have this um, unfortunate evolution of family structure in the United States where an increasing proportion of younger people were raised in single family homes. That puts a burden on mothers and disproportionately obviously a burden on mothers of color given the stats on this. It also makes wealth uh, building more difficult. It also may make, uh, in ways we haven't yet calculated, the commitment of uh, children to be caregivers for parents that they may not be so familiar with, a more complicated proposition than we've uh, started to discover or think about. Um, then there's the rise of live alone seniors. All around the world, people want independence and autonomy. It's a revealed preference. Um, we are on a path that has never been trodden before, however. When we look at the proportion of total society that stands to be live alone seniors in the oldest old group, the 80 plus group. I document this with some projections into the future. The numbers look a bit like science fiction, and if you break it down for particular states, it looks even more dramatic. Is it possible to imagine that by 2050, there will be states in the US where almost 4% of the total population of the state is live alone persons over the age of 80? Yes. Uh, stay tuned, we're on that track. And that obviously is going to increase the requirements for care in ways that we haven't even really begun to think about. Um, then there is the whole question of financial preparedness. Um, our country is sloshing in money. I mean, we have generated an extraordinary amount of wealth during this century. Uh, an additional $50 trillion, like two full Chinas. But it doesn't work out, on average, to be a million dollars a household. <laughs> um, and actually, if you take a look at the proportion of homes with zero net worth or less, Census Bureau estimates, most recent estimates, it's a higher proportion of the total society than it was 20 years ago, than it was in the early 1990s. Um, and you say, how is this possible? Can this possibly be true? And yes, it can be true, and there, I'll give you a couple of reasons for this. One is the long-term decline in work rates for men. Guys 25 to 54 have lower employment rates today than they had in 1940 at the end of the Great 
Depression. Uh, declining work rates for women, too, since the beginning of the century. Uh, another has been the invisible explosion of our felonized population. There are probably today 20 million people in our society without, uh, who are not living behind bars but who have a felony in their background. Very hard to build up wealth when you're on that trajectory. Um, some groups are particularly affected by these trends. African Americans, the 50% mark, median mark, half of African American households, less than $10,000 estimated net worth. Latino households, estimated 50% mark, 12,000. Uh, other populations you might not necessarily think about, renters, uh, you know, uh, over 35% of American homes are renter homes, median mark, $2,000, $2,200 net worth. Half have less than this. Um, clearly, uh, when we have trends like this going forward, it's going to be very, very difficult for a growing proportion of America, I fear, to prepare for financially for the extraordinary expense and cost that personal caregiving could entail. Um, what do I take home from this? The world is a moving target, I said, and these trends are not good, but there is a ray of hope, I believe. And the ray of hope has to be research, research breakthrough. We're not going to change, uh, we're not going to fix the family in the next generation. Uh, we're not going to change trends in uh, independent living, I don't think, in the next generation. And we may not even do much in preparing for wealth building for vulnerable populations in the next generation. But if we do the moon launch successfully, the moonshot successfully on research breakthrough, we can have a game changer here. And that can make up, uh, counteract for so many of the uh, potential crises that I've described. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for those really interesting observations. Um, I would like to move now to Dr. Vega. Uh, Dr. Vega, a fellow board member at Us Against Alzheimer's and a provost professor at USC with appointments in social work, preventative medicine, psychiatry, family medicine, psychology, and gerontology. He is also the executive director of the Roybal Institute on Aging and has done uh, an enormous amount of work uh, in the Latino population. You have, in particular, Dr. Vega, studied the economic impact of dementia on communities and reported on the burden, in particular, on older Hispanic uh, Americans. So can you tell us more about that work uh, and adding to what Nick had to say earlier? Well, I, I think the... Uh presentation that was just given is a great segue for what I'm going to be talking about. I have to say, you know, on a personal note that, uh, you know, really uh, I've spent decades uh, looking at health profiles and understanding health uh, from an epidemiologic perspective, demographer, also clinical researcher. And, uh, you know, I, I come to the conclusion, you know, from all of this that uh, nothing has the impact of actually living through it. And I have done just that with uh, my father-in-law. And it gave, me, uh, it gave me a different sense of priority. It gave me a sense of, of contour of what these, what these facts really mean when they play out in real life circumstances. So I want to talk a little bit about both of those, those things. I'll start out first by saying that, of course, uh, you know, we have a population, a Latino population, which in itself is extremely uh, heterogeneous and complex. And it's difficult to make broad you know, statements about this. Uh, we tried the best we could, and the report that uh, you've all been given and, and have had available, uh, when we made this uh, estimate on cost expansion here that we're going to see over time for the Latino population in both formal costs and informal costs of care, and, and medical care and informal care. I want to just say that uh, clearly, since we know what we know, and, and we know the limitations of that, the costs uh, that we project here are actually quite conservative, because uh, you know, we don't have a universal figure for prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in Latino populations. We, we know with a couple of regional studies only in California and New York, they were quite different in their projection. In fact, it was a three times higher projection in New York than there was in California. Since the Latino population is 60% Mexican, which that, that lower projection was based on, we took that approach here for the Latino population, weighted it that way, and took the higher projection only for Dominicans and Puerto Ricans in, in the New York and, and uh, Northeast area. So actually, another group can come along and have, even at USC, 
and project it on the higher rate, and of course you're going to get higher estimations. So whatever base rate you're going to use is going to produce a very different cost figure. Even at the cost figure we use, it, you see very quickly the acceleration where uh, our cost figures go very close to uh, many others in terms of showing the phenomenal impact over the, the years of both the growth of the population that's affected, primarily because the growth of the population dem demographically is growing so quickly over 65 years of age among Latinos. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you see these rates. Now, I just want to say one thing about uh, the, the longevity of Latino popula population, which is never discussed, is a very interesting thing because and it really reflects the, the base populations that these populations came from in the first place. You know, believe it or not, the Cuban population, the Puerto Rican population out of Puerto Rico, and the Mexican population at 60 have, 65 years of age have the same life expectancy as the United States population, even though they have phenomenally high property rates, like 50% in Mexico, 100% in Cuba, probably, and uh, in, uh, in Puerto Rico, it's about 40%. So, uh, you know, c culture and, and, and the way human relations are structured make, make a very important impact. I say that only to, to make the point that in the Latino population in the United States, you know, we, 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 the way it's going to cope with this extreme poverty of having basically one-ninth of the actual asset base and 50% and, and, uh, you know, of the population existing on Social Security over 65 years of age, uh, almost 100%, you know, for their income. The way they're going to survive and the way they are surviving is 75% uh, of them uh, who are in that situation over 75 are living in, in second and three generation, two and three generation families with adult children and with grandchildren uh, some, sometimes. So that's the coping structure of these families. Having lived it, uh, I just will, will, will move from you know, the broad statistics of this, which I could go on all day with because I know them very well backwards and forwards, to just the real lived experience of this and have seen the impact it has on the relational structure of these, uh, these caregivers and those that are the peripheral caregivers in these families. And it turns into a, a very difficult situation because you know now more and more there is no one available really that's free, that isn't working, uh, who is an adult in these households uh, because these households now are, have experienced lower fertility and, and wives are working, which they didn't before in these households. And so you have a situation where somebody's gonna have to give up and experience the employment situation where they're going to be put in peril in terms of the income from their employment and the security of that employment. And quite often, if there are, there are younger adults involved in this, their own development will be impeded in terms of education and career development because they become uh, people who are spotty on the job because they have to be able to take care of emergencies at home. And, if, and I don't think it's ever appreciated in these, in, in, from the outside looking in. What happens, even in these family structures, because the stress of that individual caregiver or the, the, the additional caregivers in the household is so great and the deterioration is so great, and it works on the quality of the relationships they have with the rest of the family members enormously. It really wears them down. I think it's underappreciated by the other family members how serious that wear down really is, because they're, they're contributing financial resources uh, in, among other family members, which they think is more than sufficient. You know, that, well, we're giving you the money kind of situation. And this turns into a lot of perversities that, that can, can occur in, in family systems, because the person who's in the household of course, feels the victim. As, you know, if, they, if they are adult children taking care of a family member or even the, the, both family members because they're both older and they're both you know, ultimately experiencing a great deal of wear down and of weathering you know, in, their, in their quality of life and the disease burden that they experience. The end product of this, I think, is just a lot of conflict and difficulties and quite frankly, I would point the finger to the, the critical issue uh, which we don't talk about too much in here, but whoever gets that power of attorney and starts controlling things in the, in the family because the, the adult family member is no longer competent because one has Alzheimer's and the other one is so worn down from the care that they've been given. And that circumstance turns into a very dangerous one and really ultimately affects the family structure in, in such a debilitating way for the long haul, not just for the lifetime of the individual with Alzheimer's disease and, and the other caregiver who will ultimately uh, be in, in not too long in, in future also dying. And so you end up with a situation that for the long haul has affected the family and deteriorated that family. I think this is a very, very serious problem. It's, it's just underestimated and misunderstood. There's an enormous amount of, of what we consider financial abuse, but really works out in the natural interplay of these stressful circumstances where one person is in charge of a whole lot that they can't really handle. 
And uh, you know, I think that in, in the circumstances where we have social care and assistance available from the outside, it has to take into account these kinds of dynamics that are going on under high financial stress in this poverty. I know in, the, in my, in my father-in-law's circumstance, they were in, in, living in Oakland in extremely dire financial circumstances. Uh, so, so much so that you know, when my, my uh, uh, father-in-law died, uh, the, the, the house they lived in, they were on the second floor of a place that was so badly built they couldn't even get a gurney in the house to take the body out. I had to carry the dead body out with my, with my, with my brother-in-law. And it, it was a real wake-up call, what people really have to live through in these kinds of circumstances, the reality of what it's about to live in the, in the starkest circumstances of scarcity of resources and where you're just trying to get by and in trying to get by, many not good things occur and really undermine the fabric of the family for the long haul. Dr. Vega, thank you so much, and in particular for taking uh, statistics and personalizing them. Um, we are so blessed to have your courageous story because um, these statistics mean nothing um, unless we can connect them to real life. So thank you very much. Um, next, I am so happy that we have Edna Kane Williams, who is a senior vice president of multicultural markets at AARP. Uh, she is responsible for development and execution of strategy to grow the association's social impact and multicultural membership, but importantly, has done extensive research on dementia and family caregiving, um, and really has um, a, a great perspective on some of the uh, economic implications of this disease, particularly in minority communities. Um, and, and I'd like you to talk about that research and what you know, and also, um, if you can, uh, pivot to some of the solutions that you've been exploring. Uh, sure, and I'll just do a slight correction. I'm not a researcher. AARP has done a tremendous amount of research in the area of both uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, and caregiving. I come at it, I, I work at AARP, um, privileged to, to, to have the job. I was also a, a caregiver, so I'm really delighted to hear interjected in these kind of conversations the real life experiences because I could really relate to what uh, the previous speaker was mentioning. I was a caregiver of my mother in my home for six years. Uh, you talk about intergenerational impact. I often talk about my three millennial children who, when she got at her worst, they were just making career and life and sort of um, uh, one daughter was coming from the Peace Corps and they ultimately all came home and really changed their trajectory really of their lives and I'm seeing the impact of it now because I was caring for my mother who had dementia in the home. So my story is really the, the perspective of what AARP sees as solutions, but also what I see as a solution. And I bring to that as a black woman, because Alzheimer's uh, and de dementia, and I talk about this a lot because my community, I don't feel, recognizes that this is real, these are really conditions and diseases that impact uh, uh, communities of color in a, in a, uh, a stunning, stunning way, stunning way. And I don't hear that, and I'm not making, it, it, it doesn't matter what color you are, if it's in your family, right? You don't really care about those statistics, but when I talk about how to educate my community, that's the first barrier there's generally not a recognition of, because in my mind, we're not talking enough about, or perhaps we are, but, but the communities aren't privy to these conversations. I'll put it that way, because I'm not really placing any kind of blame or responsibility, but the fact that the excess uh, incidence of this disease, Alzheimer's and dementia, in communities of color is so astoundingly high, and that's not a generally known fact, is scary to me because it's only going to get worse, and the communities are ill-prepared. As I mentioned, I had a personal story, and I work at AARP half for many years, and when I went through what I went through with my mother trying to educate myself, I was shocked at how little I knew. And I often said, you, you couldn't work at a better place. How is it that you not know this? But people are preoccupied with surviving, with day to day. You know, it takes, it takes a different type of uh, fortitude to be able to, to also do the kind of research that's needed. What kind of drugs are available? Uh, the fact that this is uh, uh, occurring in my family, I have now four aunts who have Alzheimer's. What does that mean to me at the age of 62? What should I be looking at? When my mother went through 
her situation as well as my current family members. There's a lot of family angst because they don't understand this is not something they're doing on purpose. Many of my cousins say she's gotten meaner, she's eviler, you know, she doesn't cooperate, and it's like it's, it's intentional. And as much as I can talk, it, it's not getting through that this is not something that she's, she's wrecking on your life because she wants to. She literally can't help it. Uh, the whole notion of sundowners and what happens uh, at night. I mean, it's almost community lore now, uh, but still not really understood. It's like, oh my God, we have to get home before seven. Oh my God, if you're gonna try to feed her, you need to do this. In my mother's instance, she didn't sleep. So, you know, and I was working. So how do you have solutions for, you know, if you're not sleeping at night? If, and, and if they're moaning and ranting and raving, again, not on purpose, but they're family members who think you're just being spiteful. And what does that mean in terms of the day-to-day -day care and the level of abuse? Yes, there is financial abuse, but because of the stress, people are so on edge, and the mythology of what this disease is and what it makes people incapable or capable of in terms of personal choice leads to uh, poor decision-making on caregivers and, and uh, misunderstanding. And, and that can lead, honestly, to, pure, to poor uh, care. So I'd love to see, and I think what's really needed in communities is translating these kinds of conversations into real life day-to-day -day solutions. So yes, AARP is working in, in the New York State. There was just passed a uh, paid family uh, caregivers uh, act. Going to be tremendously important if people work in jobs where that's offered and if people know about it. Uh, we at AARP are focused a lot on community support systems. We just published a toolkit for churches. African American Church is a major resource uh, in the community. We've done studies that over 70% of the African American community see churches as the ultimate solution. And that's both religion, but also in terms of day-to-day, -day, how do I get through my week? It's the center of the community. It's not just someplace people go on Sunday. So if that's, the, if that's the case, what can we do? What tools can we provide churches, ministers, religious leaders, so that when someone comes in for counseling and they're complaining about someone whose personality has changed and they're just being mean to me, help them understand that they have Alzheimer's, what that means in terms of day-to-day, -day, what, what your responsibility is what help is available. There are untold impacts in terms of, it was difficult for me, and I have a very privileged job. I have many people, again, I'll talk not from a research perspective, but from my own family's perspective. People have gone out of the workforce because they can't figure out how to care for someone full time because they can't get Medicaid or don't want to use institutional solutions and the, there are limited numbers of in-home slots. They're on the waiting list, but they're not there yet. They leave them in the care of neighbors or, or unlicensed uh, individuals and something flares up and they realize I have to be home for this. But then they often make that decision. They're 56, 55. You talked about African Americans most households in terms of retirement have less, less than uh, $10,000 uh, of, of family equity. They're living paycheck to paycheck. How do they then, what are, the, what are the, the, the impacts of them leaving the workforce to care for someone? Not for a day, not for a month, not for a year. In my case, years. And you often, and I know many of you who are caregivers in the room, you wake up and you honestly say, how long is this going to go on. How long can I do this? But when it's overlaid with economic considerations, that makes it even more hard. Thank you, Edna. Um, all very, very true, and I think this is really a perfect segue to our next speaker. And I'll digress for a minute uh, just to talk a little bit about my own journey because I think it's very relevant to what we're going to hear next, and that is that my mother has had Alzheimer's for 10 years. My three boys were three, six, and nine when she was diagnosed. I was um, sort of on a major upward trajectory in a totally different career. Um, and obviously things came to a halt, but what I think I was most impoverished by, and that is because I am lucky economically, I have a husband with a great job, I had a lot of choices, and I really don't take that for granted on any minute of any day. But what I was really impoverished by was time. And this notion of time poverty, um, which is something that I think we, particularly women, 
um, live with and feel every day, but we don't name it. Um, and we actually are engaging in a, a whole society of time poverty even without the onset of dementia. And so if you layer 30 plus hours a week of caregiving on top of um, a, a woman's life, uh, you, you really do have a back-breaking situation, um, even for the most, the luckiest of us. Uh, and I consider myself uh, one of the lucky ones since I've been able to care for my mom um, and not have to fundamentally change the way I've raised my children in the meantime. Um, but that is why I'm so excited that we have innovators um, like Bert Ree at Deloitte. Um, Bert is a managing director with Deloitte Consulting. He helps clients solve human capital and talent strategy challenges to drive business performance. Um, and I'm sure his clients are happy to know that he leads the way within Deloitte um, in setting policies that uh, I will let him speak for himself, but he thinks of as talent retention uh, uh, necessities, really, um, in uh, 2017 and beyond. So, Bert, we'd love to hear about how Deloitte is leading the way to try to alleviate some of these um, pressures on time. Thank you, and, and uh, it's wonderful to be here with you all, such a, a heartfelt group and, and such a positive message and an important mission. Um, uh, at Deloitte, um, our only asset is our people, and our ability to attract and retain top talent is, is a make or break for us. Um, we, we saw over the years a lot of hidden costs in the way that our um, millennial and Gen X and even our younger baby boomers were responding to the needs of, of their aging um, uh, parents and, and families as caregivers. And, and what we found was that there was a lot of unexpected costs in terms of um, emergency leave or unanticipated time away from work or just being at work but not being at work, being distracted by, by re responsibilities at home. Uh, for, for aging parents. And uh, so, so what we did was we took a look at that and in combination with our uh, parental leave policy uh, and extended our paid leave from uh, 12 weeks to 16 weeks and extended that to both uh, men and women. Uh, so both fathers and mothers on the birth of a child or the adoption of a child. And, and, and that has really changed the dynamic in the way that men and women talk about the responsibilities of parenting uh, and also the responsibilities of, of elder care. Um, it's, it's, it's seen now within our community as an equal responsibility, which I think is so critical. Um, I know that traditionally uh, elder care has often fallen to the um, uh, one of the, the female siblings of a family. Uh, the assumption being that, that it's easier for them to take time away from work, the assumption being that, that there's a, a closer connection there. A, a lot of assumptions that, that we want to understand and, and potentially question. Um, but, but certainly our thinking has been that, that we're taking these hidden costs of time away from work or distraction from work um, and out of, of, the, uh, of the dark and bringing it to a more quantifiable place where we can say to people, you have at your disposal 16 weeks of paid leave that you can use to care for a, an aging parent or a sibling or a spouse. Um, and, and you can use that time in a, one, one continuous piece or you can use it in small chunks as needed. Uh, but what we find is that it helps people get through transitions. Um, if there's an emergency, if there's a need to change from home care to um, uh, 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 assisted care living, um, if there's a need to uh, deal with a, a, an onset of, of a condition. It helps our employees make that transition with their um, um, elder family members and then get to an, a, a place of stability. Um, we, of course, also have lots of resources in terms of employee assistance programs to refer or to guide or to, to coach and educate. Um, but the key thing uh, that, that we found is that our employees significantly value this benefit for its option value. In other words, only about four or five percent of our employees at any one time are taking advantage of, of this paid leave program, uh, which is a pretty small percentage when you look at the total population. But what we're hearing, and, and this is actually an unintended benefit, what we're hearing is that almost every employee looks at this as a potential option that they will be able to use at some point in the future. And, and I'm hearing from colleagues and from uh, some of our younger employees who are saying, I can now see a long-term path for myself 
in this business because I have this option available to me. As my parents age, I don't know if they're going to need my help or not, but I know that I have that option available to me, guaranteed 16 weeks of paid leave where I can take care of my parents if I need to, guaranteed 16 weeks to take care of a new child. And um, for women coming back from um, um, delivery, there's an additional um, eight weeks of uh, disability time, which can take it up to six months of, of, of paid time. Um, so it, it's changed the nature of the conversation uh, for folks that, that are with us or are con considering joining us to say, this is a real benefit, this is a time benefit, um, as well as an economic benefit, and, and how we have helped people talk and, 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 and plan more explicitly for these types of needs as opposed to trying to just work it into an already busy schedule trying to, to juggle both work and, uh, and, and family care. So um, we've seen a real uh, positive response from, from our folks, and we've been able to use this story to talk to our clients that we advise on how they manage their employee benefits and how they help their employees um, manage their responsibilities. So we, we feel like we're, we're drinking our own Kool-Aid here. Thank you, Bert. So now we go to the trenches. Uh, Kamari Amora Hollis, who uh, is here, um, is part of the genius of caring, is a caregiver herself. Um, and I would be interested to hear not only about your personal story, but as you listen to these experts um, and as you think about either what did or uh, didn't help you on the beginning of your journey and what, um, what might really make a difference uh, as you look back and as you might advise people who are, are beginning their journey as caregivers. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my journey, um, I unfortunately was pretty familiar with kind of navigating healthcare systems because I was a caregiver for my father as well. Um, and so he had a brain tumor, so I kind of helped to navigate him through healthcare systems, through various cl clinical trials until he passed away, but that was a much, much shorter um, journey. So about two years later, when my mother started showing systems, um, I knew kind of what to do, but my mother and father were very different socioeconomically, so my mother is poor. She doesn't have any, she didn't have any assets, she didn't have any net worth. She worked, she worked her whole life, but didn't save didn't really have any benefits, didn't really kind of do any planning, any future planning. Um, so if anybody is uh, familiar with working with low-income people, there's kind of a, a hustle you have to do a little bit. So you have to figure out how much money you can make in order to be eligible for certain benefits and kind of balance what's, what is it worth it to have actual cash or is it worth it to have no money so you can be eligible for certain social programs. Um, so we kind of had to do that dance to figure out what social programs she was eligible for because she, what, we weren't going to be able to afford any kind of care just on cash. So we, I, we are from Massachusetts, so we have um, pretty good health care options for low-income folks, but it was really just kind of, I mean, knocking on doors at different mass health offices, each person telling me a different situation. One person told me, if you get somebody to write a letter that says she works five hours a week, then we'll give you this benefit. Another person telling me that um, because she had worked for so long, she couldn't get mass health and she was 58 at the time, she was gonna have to wait until she was 65. Um, just kind of uh, so many different options until we finally found, I, honestly I can't even remember how we actually ended up getting it to work, but. We ended up getting her into a day program, um, and that day program uh, really helped a lot with the the time. Just kind of like, you know, because it wasn't even. My mother has been called a medical marvel many times. Um, she's pretty asymptomatic until she's not. So she's had um, two hospitalizations um, where we were told that we needed to get her affairs in order. And then the next week, she's back out in the street asking me why she can't have a boyfriend. So there's like, you know, so we do a lot of, there's a lot of back and forth with that. That's a whole nother topic too. <laughs> um, next panel. Yeah, next panel. Um, but even from that, you know, we, we're, even, even when those hospitalizations happen, for some reason, 
her insurance, they didn't recognize the certain insurance she has because she's through this elder service plan. It has to go through them. So she gets bills, you know, thousands of dollars worth of bills in the mail. And, you know, I generally check her mail and everything. But if I don't get to something and she gets a bill in the mail for $5,000, I mean, that sets her off. So, you know, it's just that, that whole kind of journey to get there so sorry. We got to this, to the daycare program. And they were, they're able to take care of all the other things. So her primary care is there, her dentist is there, her eye doctor is there. All those other things that were just taking up so much of my time, they're able to deal with. So it's, it was, it's really great to get her into there and I'm very grateful for the social programs we have in Massachusetts. Um, it took us about three years to get her into those. Um, and those three years of my life were pretty much a blur, I think. I've been lucky to have jobs that have been understanding and flexible and since this that's had to be a prerequisite for me in order to take a position I have to have a job that's understanding that I may just have to get up and go to the to the hospital one day and I met and I come back for a couple of days um, and I've been lucky to have that but um, it's I, I think that that the and just kind of like what everybody was saying that the 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 low income and then the not having kind of access to any of these social programs is really what kind of the major, the, one of the major difficulties of, of getting this diagnosis was for us. So. Thank you. Mike is working. Um, if we can actually open this up for questions from the audience, um, I'm sure there are many. Uh, so, are you, Jason? There's some questions over here. Uh, I'd like to ask the director at uh, Bert Ray if you would consider doing a commercial of the policy program, your lead program that would inspire other corporations to look at that and understand the impact that it has across the board? Um, I'd be happy to, to, I'd be happy to consider that. And, and it's certainly not, I'm not, I'm not the marketing director of our firm, um, but I think it's a great, a great idea. Uh, we're always looking for ways to tell that story. Thank you. Okay, um, so I, I we enjoyed the panel, and I have another question for Bert. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, the policy that you outlined at Deloitte about um, providing leave, family leave, for, for caregivers and care partners is, is excellent. But I think one of the challenges that we're going to be facing in the next few decades to come is to make sure that our workforce uh, is, you know, that. Uh, that our, our American companies uh, are able to accommodate a wide range of cognitive profiles and, and cognitive diversity. Um, what steps is a company like Deloitte taking? Or maybe um, what you see in some of your, uh, your competitors or how you maybe advise other businesses, how do you encourage them to accommodate uh, a workforce that may be uh, living and working with dementia? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, we're, we're seeing in the workforce transition. Um, our, our, our baby boom population is reaching retirement age at a rate of 10,000 per day. And, and that's leaving a gap because the next generation, our, our Gen X folks, are significantly fewer than the baby boom generation. And it's not until we get to the millennials that we see that level of, of um, um, uh, participation in the workforce resume. So there's a gap in the middle there. And what we're seeing is that organizations are going to have to think of ways to fill that gap, either to uh, encourage or work with um, retirement age baby boomers to stay in the workforce. And that may require some accommodations, as you suggest. Um, and how do we um, increase the level of flexibility in the workplace? How do we uh, get creative about scheduling time? Uh, perhaps uh, more offer to opportunity for part-time work, more opportunity for part-year or seasonal, even seasonal work. Um, and, then, and then how do we help uh, augment capabilities where we may see decline? Um, I think there's some really fascinating stuff that's coming to fore around augmented intelligence and AI 
and robotic process automation, which may make um, uh, certain tasks uh, open to a wider range of capabilities. Uh, so I, I think it's a really interesting topic, and uh, certainly we're talking with our clients about how to anticipate that, and we're looking at that uh, ourselves as well. But I think it's about, could, it's about flexibility. If I can just add from the nonprofit um, uh, arena, AARP does have a separate category of leave called caregiving leave. That's on top of our maternity and paternity leave uh, that's, that's refilled every year that our, our staff can use specifically for caregiving. Uh, hi, my name is Janet Morris, and I've been an elder law attorney at a nonprofit in Los Angeles for the last 33 years. And I just wanted to express and reflect some of the things that all of you said. Um, one of the unique things about Alzheimer's and caregiving is um, it's not $6,000 a year that's the direct and indirect cost to people. It's more like $60,000 a year. And I'm talking about the lowest level of care costs that Medi-Cal would pay for, that Medicaid would pay for. So if you're at home, it would be about 30,000 a year. If you're in an institution, it would be about 90,000 a year. So the costs are very, very great. And talking about aggregate of millions and billions to people may not make the same impact as talking about the actual costs of care. The other thing is there are not enough institutional beds. There hasn't been an in a nursing home bed built in California probably in the last 20 years. So the fact that we're graying and needing more care, we don't have a place for all those people. And if people on fixed incomes lose their, um, their housing, they're gonna be homeless. So we're gonna face, <laughs> and there's no place for them to go because they can't afford it. And the last speaker mentioned that she went, it took her three years to figure out how to pay for care. Medicare does not pay for any long-term care. It's only acute care in hospitals and rehab institutions. No long-term care. Medicaid is the only payer for long-term care. And there's 34 different programs in California for Medi-Cal, which is Medicaid in California. So it's really hard for people to understand. And I think being an elder law attorney at a nonprofit for low income with very diverse clientele, um, at least people were able to come and get legal services um, and specifically to do some long-term care planning like powers of attorney and trust because everybody's going to lose their capacity to make decisions who has Alzheimer's in the near or distant future. So it's really incumbent on people to be able to know what to do for family members um, and for people impacted. So there's um, another piece of the puzzle, which is, yes, there's a lot of elder abuse and we want to fight against that, but people also have to do their planning um, about around public benefits around their property, around how to pay for care, and around caregiving issues. So I appreciate all the panels so far. They've been amazing, and this panel's been amazing. But I just wanted to add that other little piece of the pie. Thank you. Can I just add something to that as well? Um, when you are on a public benefit, you cannot save. So you know, even if you are able, you know, my, my mother is not, before she was diagnosed, she, didn't, she wasn't great with money. Um, and so when I took over, I kind of consolidated a lot of her debt. And whatever extra money she had had to be spent. Because even, I think the saving limit is maybe $1,500. If you save over that, then they will take away your state benefit. So the future planning is even that much harder because you're not able to save. Dr. Vega. I, I would just add that I think underlying uh, this issue is the problem of extremely inadequate disease management in these, in these households because they simply are not understanding what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it and understanding what's going on in the stages of change in the disease and they don't know whether the medications, the 12 to 15 medications that that person is taking, that person with Alzheimer's disease that also has comorbidity of all different kinds uh, and so therefore it becomes so confusing and they cannot get in time, understandable instruction from medical guidance. Uh, they just, they get information, but the, the information isn't clear to them as to how it can be used, especially in Latino households, very low education in, in Spanish speakers. Uh, it's extremely difficult, and I, it's, it's, it's something that we really need to think in terms of perhaps the simplifying the process of bringing clarity and coherence to guiding families that are in this kind of situation. 
It doesn't have to be expensive or, or more complicated, but caregiving alone is not enough if it isn't given that proper guidance because the, the management of, this, of the caregiving process over the course of the disease becomes, frankly, incoherent. Nick? I'm really glad that you uh, brought up uh, some ballpark numbers on the annual cost of caregiving. Um, in my paper, I show some, uh, I think, maybe startling estimates by the Census Bureau about wealth holdings in the United States. Um, three in eight homes have uh, less than $25,000 of net worth. Three in, three in eight. Three in five for Latinos and African Americans have less than $25,000 in estimated net worth. And for people who are, you know, pre-seniors, people in the 55 to 64 group, it's over one in four with uh, less than estimated $25,000 net worth. What this means to me when I see these numbers is that the financial budgetary uh, public spending estimates for this uh, developing crisis in our country have been way low-balled. Um, this is going to be a public policy question. And if we, uh, if we don't have a research breakthrough, uh, this is all going to uh, involve massive, massive, currently underestimated increases in public budgets for care. Thank you all for the presentations, really fascinating and important work. I, I would just offer uh, two ideas, one for public policy, one for private sector policy, and appreciate your reflections on these as possibilities. Uh, Nick, to your point about the urgency of, of medical research, scientific research to bend the curve, vitally important part of that is money. The other part is the ability of families to participate either in the study as a person living with the disorder being studied, Alzheimer's or anything else, and the other part particular to Alzheimer's is the need for research partners to accompany the participant. And so to, to, the, public, uh, to the private policy element, I wonder to what extent companies already do or, or whether Deloitte would be willing to evangelize to other companies to begin allowing utilization not only of personal time off or paid family leave, but, but more explicitly, uh, uh, the time that a lot of companies allow their employees to participate in volunteer activities in the community to utilize that for time to participate in clinical research either as a study participant or as a, as a partner. And then the public policy question is around social security and, and the viability uh, from an economic point of view, uh, both the, the upfront costs and then the long-term gains of giving family caregivers a social security credit for time they spend as family caregivers out of the traditional workforce, but certainly making a vital economic contribution to the country. So I'd love to give everyone just a moment to either respond to Ian's uh, question and comment uh, or to just make a last comment, because unfortunately we are out of time and I, I feel as though we could continue this conversation for at least another half hour, but. Luckily, we have some additional panels um, that will touch on a number of these issues. So, Nick, why don't you start? I think, that's, I think those are both uh, really, really interesting and important suggestions, uh, and I you know, salute you for them. Thank you. No, I would just say that I think we need to hit a, a point of understanding the long-term consequences of, of long-term inequality and increasing inequality economically in the society, and that we have to do something about this because it's undermining the, the health and longevity of our population and the bottom 40% of the population. And I want to make a pitch for involving more uh, people of color in clinical trials. A lot of it is not. I know that there's a lot of outreach that is currently going on. There's still a lot of mythology in these communities. So they are, elect hi, Dr. Bird. <laughs> um, so they're not electing uh, to participate, but we've got to solve that given the landscape of where the, the uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, how, how involving it is of these communities. We have to make sure that, they, that these communities are also involved in clinical trials. Um, thank you. Great suggestions. I've written them down. Um, Deloitte does ap actively support uh, numerous um, uh, charitable causes and, and volunteer opportunities for our people to give back to their communities. Um, we, we encourage this. We sponsor it. And um, I, I think this is another great idea to, to uh, take that further. Thank you. 
I would just second the uh, clinical trial statement and also um, if, there's an, if there's an ability to have folks of color at the sites of the clinical trials, uh, any, part, any clinical trials we've participated in have all been exclusively researchers and have all been exclusively white. And um, it makes us uncomfortable and we've stopped going to not only clinical trials but also to that facility for care anyway. Um, so it just would be great to see some people of color in those places. Please join me again in thanking this amazing panel um, and back to George. I think the relevance of this panel to your conversations on the Hill tomorrow is fairly clear that we probably in very general terms have totally underestimated the impact on uh, families and society and our government budgets of the coming and looming crisis, uh, which reminds me uh, to just review the... Okay. Hill Day. You've got packets outside that will have all the fact sheets that you need, uh, that in fact will have all your appointments, you better pick it up or you're not going to know where to go tomorrow morning after breakfast or you may even not know where to go for breakfast if you don't get your hill packets. So this is just a reminder the doctor is in. Um, the uh, want to do one more This Is Us, a reminder of who the us is in Us Against Alzheimer's. So we'll play a second video. I'm Linda Everman. I'm one of millions of Americans who have been impacted by this devastating disease. I was a caregiver for 18 years for my dad and my late husband. As a founding member of Women Against Alzheimer's and the Faith United Coalition, I'm determined to use my energy, my time, and my resources to stop this disease. I believe that we are the us in Us Against Alzheimer's. My name is Deborah Cherry. I'm Executive Vice President of Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles. And what motivates me in this fight to stop Alzheimer's is the heroism of the families facing the disease. They give care against all odds and they really make a difference in the lives of their loved ones. My name is Alice Watkins and I'm the former Executive Director of Alzheimer's North Carolina. My question, what motivates you in your fight to stop Alzheimer's, is the 26 years I spent listening to families and, and the pain that is caused. And what is the main reason uh, you wish people knew about Alzheimer's is the more people know about the disease, uh, the earlier the diagnosis, the more rapidly we're going to find answers. And why are you the us in the Us Against Alzheimer's? Because I'm so excited about what Us Against Alzheimer's is doing and the many different uh, programs, Women Against Alzheimer's, CEOs Against Alzheimer's, Researchers Against Alzheimer's, and together I think one day we're gonna find the answers. I'm Johan Alexander with Us Against Alzheimer's. My grandmother passed away from Alzheimer's and my family witnessed the devastation that the disease caused. Purple Orchard is an initiative to create a generation of dementia-friendly high schoolers, which strives to help patients and caregivers in our community. Hi, I'm Luke Farrell. Hi, I'm Jack Farrell, and this is my mom, Phyllis. This is our proud bond. He had Alzheimer's disease. He passed away three years ago. My mom and her team at Lilly are working very hard to come up with a cure for Alzheimer's disease. These are my boys and my husband's behind the camera and they make a lot of sacrifices so that I can do what I do at Lilly. And that's why together we say, we're, we're us against, against Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's.